So for the last one, let's move back to Dr. Irwan. Um, Dr. Irwan, what do you think undergraduates, undergraduates during their campus as preparation for or even contribute to the fourth industry revolution IR 4.0? 4.0. Okay. Um, well, um, I, I think, I, I guess firstly, we, we want to clarify what we're talking about here for, especially for the benefit of the younger students who might not have learned about, about this yet in the class. So the, the, the scholars of economics, they have identified four industrial revolutions. So the first industrial revolution is mechanization. This is when people started to figure out how to use steam power in their machination. So they, they start to use steam engines for their locomotives, for their trains. The second industrial revolution is the, mechan um, sorry, the mass production. This is the invention of assembly lines. So you have standardized components that you can put together like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, the third one is automation. So the advent of the internet and the ever accelerating capacity of our computer processes, they amplify the connectivity of components in the value chains, meaning that from the extraction of the raw materials to manufacturing to even the customer engagement, many parts of that can be automated. And then um, the economists are talking about the fourth industrial revolution, which is arguably we are in now. And it involves merging, like convergence of biological, engineering, and digital technologies. At, at the horizon of this revolution is companies like Neuralink, if you heard of it, um, which is working on brain computer interface. So they will surgically put an implant on your brain uh, to connect you with your devices. So they have like microfibers that can read your neuroelectrical activities. So if you ask in your head, is it prayer time already? And your phone will automatically open your prayer time app for you by reading your thoughts, right? So we, we do kind we do experience this kind of revolutions, at least in part. You, you can see how disruptive it is, for example, for example, with the e-hailing services. So the rise of Uber and Grab, they wiped out the income for the, the conventional taxi drivers, no matter how skillful they are at their job. Um, I, I know this because I wrote, I wrote with these drivers to go to work before I start renting my brother's car. So I talk to them and I can tell you it's painful for them to, to go through that transition. So economic revolution is not just some fancy concepts. They do affect people. And you might think, well, I'm a biotech student. I'm not studying a program in taxi driving. Why should I worry about this, right? Well, you know that you've got some cool lab skills to do experiments, right? You have studied all these lab skills for, 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 for years. In the fourth industrial revolution, many of those biological lab skills can be replaced by affordable machines. So then why would a company hire you instead of just crowdsourcing it or, or hire cheaper technicians to push some buttons to run the same diagnostic experiments. You see, you can be like the skilled taxi drivers who's been in the field for 10 years and then you see your job disappearing. So, so how do you prepare for that? The way you prepare for something like industrial revolution, um, I would say is not by preparing towards one single thing. Like, like any revolutions, the industrial revolution brings about disorder. Things that you take for granted before the revolution can become the exact opposite after the revolution. And what's true about our parents' job market will not be true once you graduate. I guess 
one thing we can do is to reflect on other creations you know, like microorganisms the way they they survive in 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 an ever-changing environment is through rapid mutations right so they multiply the variability of their genes which allow them to encode different proteins which give them new phenotypes new attributes that help them survive in their contemporary environment so you might want to to do the psychological human version of that right you need to generate mutations you need to level up your adaptivity and don't don't think the negative connotation of the word mutation don't think like a disease mutation so think of an empowering mutations like x-men or other marvel characters so so they have skills they have attributes that most people don't so they are mutants scientifically speaking so so to thrive in the industrial revolution you need to develop skills attributes that most science students don't have you need to allow flexibility in your skill set for example for example if you study biochemistry and if you study biochemistry you don't want to just study to be a very very good biochemist researcher and nothing else you don't want to do that why because it limits your options if the industrial revolution takes a direction away from what you're focusing on right so take elective courses i think dr pratina mentioned this take elective courses that can help you maybe be cell and molecular biologists maybe possible bioprocessing engineers maybe microbiologists or even something outside of that like science product designers or science journalists so by the time you graduate when the job market present opportunities along those lines you can match it at least to some part of your diverse skill sets so you're more likely to get the job so those are the practical things that you can do so number one if it's still possible choose electives that uh, in your curriculum that is outside your major especially if it's something that you you're interested in because once you leave university it's going to take more time and money to learn something that you're deeply interested in at university that is your like your identity you are student you can study whatever you want there and that can be difficult if your curriculum is not that flexible i know this because i'm part of the curriculum designing team for the microbiology department and as a team we do try to push for more flexibility but it's not easy because we have to face this argument that says well you're offering microbiology program we want you to produce microbiologists so we need to put all the microbiology related courses but by then once we put all those things in we don't have much space for free electives so so if that's not possible if you can't study other skill sets through elective courses formally try to study yourself by taking online courses there are courses out there at Coursera and edX that offers professional certificates given by Harvard by Cambridge universities so see if you can get those and put them in your CV to match the job opportunity and also be prepared to reskill yourself right your your career path might not be a straight line so be open to the possibility of a of a lateral move move to the side that you need to learn something completely different than your current degree to uh, to adapt to job opportunities i think biomix can help with this because the government has this upskilling and reskilling programs uh, we lecturers heard it from dr wan zuhainis uh, who is in the ministry now so maybe biomix committee can get those information and spread it to the graduating students and um, i guess finally uh, on top of those adaptive strategies you you can also try to go deeper when you study your core courses like i mentioned before robots and machines can replace the, your basic lab techniques 
but the contextual interpretation of the results may still need human insights. And also those machines, they need to be maintained and they need to be designed by humans. Humans who have the deep understanding of the experimental and biological concepts that underlie the, the machine's programming. So by understanding your discipline, your core subjects deeply, you have a chance to fulfill those roles. So you can be valuable despite the unpredictable outcomes of the industrial revolution. All right, that's all I can think of at the moment. Thank you.